Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And although she doesn't really need much of an introduction, I'm going to try and describe our guest, Anuja Chauhan, to you. So if you've ever said the words, ye dil mangi more, dar ki aage jeet hai, peda hai par meera hai, be the logical, break to banta hai, you're already speaking a little bit of Anuja Chauhan. And um, she's an advertising executive turned author who has not only given us some of the most iconic advertising slogans, but she has also given us five best-selling novels. And her characters are chaotic, they're real, they're funny, they're always relatable, and they have like these weird moral compasses which make them so much more human. And so without further ado, let's just get to know more about her from herself. So um, the first question itself is that if you were supposed to sell Anuja Chauhan, um, how would you do that? Like as if you were a brand and you were supposed to come up with an advertising slogan for yourself, what would it be? Oh God, that's horrible. That sounds so much like work. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think, uh, um, I think as I get older, I just get crankier and crankier and more obnoxious. And so I think it would be something like that. I mean, like, um, yeah, I think I'm not like good wine. I think I'm like bad wine. I'm just getting worse every single year. So I think something like that, you know, like some, some Katia wine kind of baseline. I would have for myself. <laughs> Okay. So, um, now getting on to the work-related stuff. So do you think that writing The Zoya Factor was an easier process for you since it was your first novel? And then mm. once the book released and, you know, it grew to be a bestseller and then it became a movie, did you yourself start putting more pressure on yourself? And, you know, face more writer's block and all this like external pressure that I have to live up to what I have done before? No, that's true. I mean, like, you know, your first thing is always you have absolutely nothing to lose. You know, the, the big high is being published. And it wasn't just the Zoya Factor. The very first advertising campaign I did when I was 22 years old, it's like probably you guys or something, was for Pepsi. It was a very breakthrough campaign called Nothing Official About It. And it probably happened before you all were like even born or something. It happened the year my daughter was born and she's 25 now. So, uh, and that was a huge hit. And after that, there was so much pressure on me that Anuja writes something as good as nothing official about it. And so my entire advertising career started here and then slowly sloped downwards. That's how it worked out. And I think with Zoya, it was a similar thing because when I wrote the first book, it was so euphoric. I can't tell you Viva. It was like, is it Viva or Viva? How do you pronounce your name? Viva. 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 So, uh, yeah, so Viva, that first book, I mean, I felt like people were stopping in the corridor and saying, are you having an affair? What are you doing? Why are you going? Why are you so happy? Because it was so amazing. I was like freed from the box of that very tight advertising brief and, you know, everything having to be uh, researched and such a tight little box you worked in. Then there were movie stars and there were budget constraints and there was research and all that kind of thing. So it was very euphoric writing that book and it was just so exciting it got published and um, that is like that first time always is an amazing high whether it's first love or it's first book or whatever it is the first thing is always very special in itself so yeah and after that subsequently i also started feeling ki bhi meri bhi thodi aukat hai. i have a <laughs> reputation to maintain now and must let my fans down and then you start getting all these notions right but I think that always happens uh, whenever you do, like, that is the first time. But I also feel somewhere that, you know, subsequent books, um, I feel, I feel personally that the quest is always to get better with each book. And I do feel that my books are more nuanced now, have better language and uh, things like that, you know. Uh, as I grow as a person, then hopefully my characters also deepen and have more shades and more layers and stuff. And um, I get that kind of feedback from people sometimes that they like the latter heroes more than the hero in the Zoya Factor, for example, who's a bit of a cardboard cutout kind of a guy. So, yeah. No, I see that. But I also um, watched in one of your interviews, you were talking about how you've like set this kind of routine for yourself that you have to write like a thousand words a day. Like, however bad they are, you want to do that. No, so, I, uh, I do that when I'm like into a book, right? So there's this point yeah. when you're sort of coasting and you're between books and you're like looking around for ideas and you don't know for sure what you're going to do next at which point obviously there's no um there's no word limit or anything because that time you're just grazing and uh, uh, 
I think there are two phases. There's a phase when you're out there in the world and there's a phase when you're in your cave. When you're in your writer's cave, then a thousand words a day for sure. Once you figure out what you want to write and then you go into the cave and you're like, you're like a surly bear and you're like, just leave the food outside the door and all that kind of thing. So uh, that, that stage, a thousand words a day is nothing. I mean, it can be more. I've written my latest book during the lockdown and I think at one point I was writing 4,000 words a day because that's all I was doing. But there are entire months and even years sometimes where I'll write columns and I'll write some movie script and I'll do some advertising work and I won't write anything as far as my novels go. So it sort of moves like that. Right. I see. Yeah. Yeah, but like, so when you're writing the novel itself, you don't face writer's block or you do? Of course you do. You do. I mean, everybody does. And I find that uh, what happens, one, one very good thing is to let it rest. Uh, I think in the lockdown, everybody's making banana bread. We've all become some real bakers over here. So everybody now understands how yeast works, right? You put in the yeast and then you let the yeast sort of slowly like rise in its own sweet time. And so you need to let it rest and then you pick it up again. So I think that's important and you shouldn't put too much pressure on yourself. Another thing that I always told my kids in advertising was don't try too hard. Itna zor mat lagao, itna zor lagao ke to bas pote niklega. And uh, that is true. <laughs> so, you know, don't, 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 don't kill yourself. The effort will always show. I see. No, that is quite true. And um, just moving back a little bit to when you were writing the Zoya factors, you were simultaneously also working at, with advertising. Yes. So yes. was there ever a time when you came up with like a very witty dialogue or like a slogan or something, but you wanted to save it for the Zoya factor or you wanted to like, okay, fine, I'll just use it as a campaign. No, you know, the Zoya factor is full of rejected campaigns. I mean, all the cheap pattas that I couldn't get to put in ads are stuffing in that book. It's like a fruit cake. It's just full of these random puns. And sometimes like whole pages have been written just to accommodate something that I'm frantic to put in, which I couldn't sell anywhere. So it definitely does have that. Uh, it, it's got a lot of like, it's like a tutti fruity, right? There's all kinds of leftovers stuffed in and then you're like masala buying it. So I think Zoya suffers the most from that. Subsequently, I learned that if it doesn't really fit, so leave it out. But yeah, of course, that does happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so just like a little bit more about that time. So do you think it's feasible for writers to only start off with like focusing on their writing? Because like I know writers don't really own very well, especially when you're like just starting off. So do yeah. you think it's necessary to have like a more stable job that you're simultaneously doing? I think so. See, I wrote Zoya after I've been working in advertising for 14 years and then I continued with my advertising job and my full-time writing and full-time mothering of three young children for four years. And it was pretty nuts. Uh, but I did do it. You know, I was like, by that time I was desperate to get out of advertising. So I was like, like a prisoner who's digging a hole out of a prison with one small tin spoon, you know. So every day I'm digging at my little tunnel. So one day I can tunnel myself out of advertising. So um, I, I wrote two books. And once I reached the point where I knew the books were selling well and I could sustain myself financially at the same level as I was, the kind of money I was getting in advertising by that time, I could earn the same money from my book writing. That's when I let the book, um, book writing become like my main job and you know move out of the advertising mm -hmm. thing so you have to do both you're right you don't earn very much if that's the only thing you're doing and more importantly you can't keep your writing pure i think if you're writing mm -hmm. and you really need the money then you tend to do sensationalistic things and maybe um you know try and come up with stuff that you think is catchy or will sell and so your motives are a little tainted mm -hmm. and i don't think that's good for anybody's writing that does make sense. Um, and so like why the sudden urge to quit advertising or did you always know that you wanted to quit advertising? No, actually see what happened was that I start, I, I uh, got into advertising because I wanted to write and I left advertising because I wanted to write. Uh, when I joined, Adver I mean, I done economics in class. Uh, I went to Miranda House, Delhi University and mm -hmm. I did eco. And but in school, I was always very much, you know, I was on the... I published the school magazine and I was writing a lot of plays and you know that very like declamation just a minute debating kind of thing so I did like writing and I definitely liked reading so then my boyfriend who was subsequently married he said that you know a good like it'll be a 
you're a little creative, but you also do economics. So advertising is a good match, right? It's a place where both mm-hmm. these things join. And what happened is that initially when I was writing my ads, it was much more creative. But then as I kept getting kicked upstairs and you get more and more promotions, then mm-hmm. suddenly it wasn't so creative anymore. It was much more the economic side of things started to surface, you know. I had a large team. I had people coming crying to me all the time saying, what about my promotion? And, you know, I don't even know. And so it was like I was a mummy for three children at home and in office I'd become a mummy also. And I had this vast brood of kids. And it was like, how much writing will I do? Oh, there's a client. You're holding the client's hand. You're doing a lot more admin duties as you get more and more senior. And not so much mm-hmm. your writing work. So, and I realized that that's the only way it's going to go. I mean, if I carry on in this line of work, it's not just going to be those early days of we going for a shoot and we've got a budget and we've got a deadline and we need to make all these fun ads with all these fun cricketers or these fun movie stars. So that was all sort of going away and becoming really boring. So I actually quit advertising so I could focus on my writing and not on the other aspects. So. No, I, I get what you mean. And like, it's, it's funny that you did end up where you wanted to be. Like mm-hmm. eventually you are writing. So whatever you feel you were in, you were writing. Um, so I'm, all of us, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of us know that you take inspiration from the people around you and the people you've spoken to. And you know, like you call yourself like a professional eavesdropper. So um, how do you get strangers to talk to you? Like usually it's just a small talk you can make with strangers. So are you like a people person? Do people like talking to you? I hope so. Sometimes I eavesdrop. I don't even, people don't even know I'm listening. I'm like, I'm that bad. Like on aeroplanes and all, I just listen. Nowadays, I'm not traveling so much. But um, I, I love listening to people talk. Uh, wherever they are, I don't even have to know them. I can just like listen in just for fun. Mm-hmm. So I do do that. But yeah, I love talking to people. And I actually find that one-on-one conversations are amazing. There is a group dynamic. Like if you're writing scenes which have like like a gang, you know, like a bunch of college kids, mm-hmm. that's a different kind of banter, reparty. That, those will always be the more fun, funny conversations, right? But if it's like what my daughter calls a DMC, which is deep, meaningful conversation, mm-hmm. that is usually like a one-on-one and there's some hot chocolate involved or there's some alcohol involved and there's a lot of deep eye contact. Mm-hmm. And then you get people to tell you stuff and then you tell them stuff and it's like, you show me yours, I'll show you mine. It's kind of like an emotional striptease, you know, like you're like peeling off layers as you go and it's amazing. So I, I do like that. And, uh, Uh, I enjoy doing that and I make time to do that with my friends. I mean, it's nice to meet people in a group or anybody in a group, but it's also nice to just connect one one on one at parties. Even if you go out, you'll find one drunk person sitting there, you go talk to them, you might have an amazing conversation. And I also like to talk to people, you know, we tend to gravitate, especially when you're younger, you tend to gravitate towards people like us. But I think it, you can have better conversations with people who are not like us and uh, more enriching conversations for sure and more to learn, right? If someone is older than you, younger than you, richer than you, poorer than you, from a different, completely different background, maybe culturally or politically or in their mindset. So those are always amazing conversations, you know. And once I sat next to this like hardcore bhakta on a plane and we had an amazing conversation. And I would have been like, you bhakta many baat karungi. But then it was quite a crazy conversation. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, so is it from these people that you get the plots for your stories from too or is it just purely like character inspiration that comes from them and then the plot you think of yourself? Usually it's different for each book. You know, sometimes like a, like Zoya Factor is a very high concept book. It is about what if a girl was born at the moment India won the World Cup and how would that change her life? How would like the theme, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of high concept. Sometimes it's not so much a concept. Sometimes it's a conflict or a theme that interests you. Sometimes just a visual image you have. Like for Battles of Bidor, I had this image of, you know, like today is the day of an election and here are our two candidates embracing each other on the newspaper cover. And then, you know, like as a voter, you're like, okay, what is going on here? And who do I vote for? Um, so every time it's something different. The house that BJ built is on themes of forgiveness. Uh, those Pricey Taku Girls is about freedom of speech and it's like my little ode to the 80s. So there the idea is a little vaguer, but the, you know, the, the background and all is what like really got me into writing that book. Bars is very much, I think, a conversation that we interests all of us, which is the whole thing of, you know, pacifism versus uh, like patriotism or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. So each time it's different, yeah. But there is usually oh, there is something every time that gives you a reason to get out of bed. And it needs to be a reason for me to get out of bed because I, you read my book, you read it in one night, two nights, you're done. 
I live with it for two years. So I have to really feel for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so like, like you were talking about all the books. Like, I think when people try to label you as chiclet, I didn't exactly see it because I feel like your books are so much beyond just like a typical romance or a family drama because there's so much research involved. So how do you go about with like the research of your books, be it like the 1971, the Indo-Pakistan war um, for bars or, you know, um, the, all the politics for battle for Victoria. So how do you go about mm-hmm. the research? Mm-hmm. It's always, uh, all my books are at some level autobiographical. You know, I, I tend to write about uh, subjects that I know well or a world that I'm familiar with or because otherwise I always find that it'll sound fake, it'll be a false note. So I do take a cheap shortcut or sticking to things that I've been exposed to, you know. So for Battle for Bitora, the whole political background came from my mother-in-law's political background. And I went campaigning for her a bunch of times and I was really struck by how ridiculous the whole process is beyond everything else. It's also just really funny. So, uh, so sometimes the research is soft, like that soft research, even for bars. I mean, my dad was in the army. I grew up in cantonments. Um, one of my, my oldest first cousin and my only mama G are like, you know, really like these very swashbuckling kind of IAF fighter pilots. So you go to them for inspiration. You remember those memories. Uh, my newest book, the one I wrote in lockdown is set inside a club which is modeled on like a Delhi Gymkhana club or an old army club, which is a background I know really well. So I always try to take a shortcut by picking something I'm familiar with. And then of course you also do the hardcore stuff, right? You you read up on it, you read books, you meet people. Uh, for bars, I met a lot of retired fighters and a lot of current fighters and we, you know, we drank a lot of alcohol and we talked about lots of things and it was amazing. So. Um, so it's a mixture a, a lot of it is just intuitive and feeling and emotion based and a lot of it is of course you 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 read up on it you google it you meet people and so it's a combination of both but I love doing research it's great fun no it does it sounds a lot of fun I wish that research was boring yeah, but the way you describe it it sounds like a lot more fun it is fun <laughs> okay so just um, like continuing with that so writing is usually a very like um solitary job which is like you and your screen or like however you write whereas advertising on the other hand like how much i know of it it's a very uh, people job you're like working together with a team so when that shift happened did you find it weird or did you like it was it hard to get used to working all alone or did you have like people you were talking to, like did, were there other people involved in your writing process um see yeah you're right so usually for me actually i haven't like totally given up the advertising i still do like campaigns like last year i did a campaign for the congress party for the election Mm -hmm. complete fail but whatever i like put my hand to the wheel and pushed as hard as i could but um yeah so i do enjoy the camaraderie and you know the politics like office politics Mm -hmm. is like the biggest thing and it's so and the office canteen like today we all got a mail uh, like so sweetly like the guy who used to run our canteen in jwt he wrote saying you know guys i have no money because in the lockdown nobody's eating in my Mm -hmm. canteen and you know so so you have all that lovely human contact and all the gossip Mm -hmm. and all the it's beautiful right but sometimes it gets to you. So again, like I'm saying, you spend some time in your cave and that's great too. And you spend some time gathering life. You go out there and you have experiences. So you have something to write about, you know. So I guess, you, again, you try to balance that. So, um, so, so yes, the writing work is quite lonely. But in the middle, I do do, I do some film work and I do some advertising work and I, you need to balance both. You definitely can't live your life in a cave for sure. No, I see. Um, and also just moving on a little bit to our theme for this month, which is all about women empowerment and giving them a platform to speak. So um, something I've noticed is that although your books could be classified to some extent like as a romance, like a romantic novel or something, or at least it has some element of it, um, something different about your novels is that um, although like yeah, the man is usually a hero, but in your novels, the female becomes the hero of the story. And like the typical hero, the man of the story is just one of the many things, you know, in her life. Yeah. Like be it like any of the novels. So um, why do you decide to write this way? Is it because what you're familiar with? No, I think it's just that that's a life in balance, right? I mean, like nobody like stays romantic 24 hours a day. I, I mean, 
So even if you're madly in love with somebody, you maybe have this ecstatic WhatsApp exchange or some Snapchat exchange or whatever it is you guys are doing nowadays. But then you have the rest of the day, right? You'll walk your dog and you'll run your chores and your parents will come in and say something and you'll have some irritating sibling who'll come in and there'll be homework, there'll be some, you know, professor, some deadline. So there's all that other stuff that goes on as well. And not to mention all the kick fit, you know, the politics, your little girl gang or your gang of friends and all that stuff going on. So it's all part of this thing. You can't, if you're writing a realistic romance and all that has to come in. And that is what makes a romance sparkle and shine so nicely, you know, because you have this, like you need darkness around to have that brightness. Now you need, like, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can't eat all the time you eat and then you don't eat and you work up an appetite and you eat again. So I think that that's just, that is realistically how a romance plays out. It's always part of many things. And I do feel that maybe we've given the whole romantic relationship too much importance. You know, um, like we, why such a big celebration for a wedding, for example? Why so much money? Why mm -hmm. so much drama? Why does Abhya Sachi Lenga? You could just as well um, have an occasion like that with your best friend and say we are now best friends and we will exchange best friend lockets and invite everybody i mean that's also an important relationship uh, you have relationships like that with your siblings and with friends and with teachers and with colleagues or maybe your first boss is an amazing person you know so there's so many relationships and eventually i think we work towards a place where we have a circle you know a safe circle with maybe a romantic partner or sibling, some friends, some older people. Uh, that That is ideally how your life should be, right? Some non-human contact. Maybe there are some animals in your life who are very important to you. Like a lot of kids have cats and dogs and all kinds of pets. So I'm saying that, you know, I think maybe we give too much importance to the romantic relationship and maybe we shouldn't. And we put so much pressure on it also, na? It's so much pressure on that one miserable relationship. All your expectations, you're going with your zindi ka bar of like every Hindi movie you watch with the romantic thing and you're putting all the pressure on this one boy or this one girl that now you have to be all these things. It's so unfair. I mean, it's not right. No, uh, yeah, I'm so glad you did mention this because I feel like it's very important because a lot of the times people try to like classify like uh, romantic books is like oh there should only be romance in it nothing more you know like this is all it should have so i'm glad that you've decided to go beyond yeah. and um another really interesting and very I, I personally love the fact is that a lot of your characters the reason why i can read it so easily is because i can relate to them so apart from being sp spunky and feisty they also it's not exactly like good people or bad people you know there's no one like very pure like none of the women in your book are like you know saints or who should be worshipped or something uh -huh. you know they all make they do everything so yeah. um do you love writing these gray characters because you find them more human no but people are gray who is this perfect white person <laughs> who is this preeti from kabir singh that you know i don't know anybody like that there's no such person they don't exist it's rubbish and even if they did, you would never be friends with that person because they match just like an unqualified board. So, um, I think everybody is grey and I don't think there's anything wrong with being grey. So, um, I, I, again, like the quest is always authenticity, you know, you're just trying to create real people and therefore they can't be black and white. You can't have this one, you know, P.A. Deku, Bhagwan Ram, Mary Novel Ke Hero Hai. What is that? I, I don't get that. No, and I mean, another thing about this too, so like another reason how your books are so authentic is because, you know, the language in your books, it's like noticeable, but it's also invisible. So like when I'm reading or when anyone's reading your novels, we don't try and like pause and have to like look up the meaning of a word or like, you know, some very complicated word, which we can't pronounce. It's more like it sounds like our own thoughts, you know, like some your friend or someone is speaking to you. It's like how Indians speak, how we interact with each other, we think. So when you made this decision to include such language like English in your novels, were you worried about the audience or your publisher's response? Like, did you think that, you know, maybe it will not be very, like, looked upon, like, greatly? People would be like, oh, look, she can't even speak English properly. Is she writing these novels? Yeah. Uh, see, this, again, like I said, the quest is authenticity. You're trying to write how we think, you know, and that, that is how we talk. Uh, so I think that in any language, there will always be like a peppering in of whatever your other language is. And Indians are all bilingual. Some of us are trilingual, we know so many languages. And we slip very easily from one to the other. 
And uh, I mean, the greats have done it. Salman Rushdie does it brilliantly in every single novel. So um, I don't see why I should give that up in order to please, I don't know which purist out there. Uh, I, I think when I write description, when I write narration in a third person voice, that I try to use good English. I mean, like what I consider good English. And uh, when I'm writing dialogue, obviously a dialogue, will be colloquial it cannot not be so like i said again it's just authenticity you're just trying to replicate real people real cadence mm -hmm. rhythms of speech you know how people will talk you get an idea of if someone has a sing-song voice or someone repeats certain mm -hmm. phrases or they have these little ticks and all it's mm -hmm. that's how the character comes alive in your head if you're writing and you're writing well there will be a point where the words will just come you know what this person will say and that's a great part that's when you're really in the zone and it's all going well yeah, um, and Sudhamurthy also really stresses upon this thing. I was watching one of her interviews and even she was talking about how Indian authors should use more colloquial English and not just mm -hmm. the English that our colonizers have left us with. Mm -hmm. And um, So when did you personally believe that you were a good or a successful writer? You know, when did you like want to give yourself that shabashi that, ha, huh, like I have succeeded at writing? Like, was it when, you know, your book was adapted to become a movie or a TV show? Or was it something more personal? I think, um, I, I think, I always think the biggest compliment is re-readability. You know, when somebody tells you, I, I've read this book so many times, or this book is on my bathroom shelf, or when I travel, I carry your book. So that is, I think that's the biggest compliment. That's when you always feel like really like you've achieved something as a writer, people say, you know, I've reread this book and uh, I, I still find it funny when I read mm -hmm. it. So that is the biggest compliment for me, you know, because I'm like that. I have mm -hmm. favorite authors and I just reread them all the time. And it's like my go-to comfort thing. So when people give you that or the, that importance, then you feel really very like special and blessed. And like, how um, many mm -hmm. are, you know, so that's mm -hmm. nice. Just a little personal snippet. So when I went off to college, my mom only let me take two books with me because I read a lot and she was scared that my dorm room would be only full of books. So one <laughs> of the books I took was one of your books. I took the house that BJ built with me. I was like, this one I can't leave behind. So oh, you definitely yeah. achieved the re-readability factor. Like I'm sure everyone who's read your books wants to go back to it because it just feels like a friend, you know, like you can imagine yourself. It's one of those situations where you can't imagine yourself in the any of the characters' space. Like when I read the books, I'm like, oh yeah, I see myself as that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, which character do you personally relate to the most? Um, they're different characters. I mean, the people I'm very fond of. I'm very fond of Ishwari from Price of Taco Girls. I'm very fond of uh, Pushpa Pandey from Battle for Vitora. Mm -hmm. I'm um, I'm really fond of Shanu. Like Ishan Fajdar is like my favorite. Mm -hmm. You know, I really like him. Uh, and uh, in my new book, also I'm very fond of my new casting, my new mm -hmm. pair. So I guess, and it's not like I only like the heroes, or, you know, the main protagonists. Sometimes I really fall in love with like a chota sa character and I'll keep pulling them in and trying to give them more lines mm -hmm. because there's so much fun. I love writing friends, you know, like in uh, bars, I love writing the gang of friends, like the other boys, mm -hmm. and three of them. And I like that. Even with uh, the House of BJ Bill, the book you mentioned, I love mm -hmm. the parts with... Uh, Oh, Samar and his friend who's the what was his name Zishan yeah so I love Zishan, yeah. yeah yeah I love writing those bits it's great fun oh, even when the girls are together in Price of Girls like I love writing the sisters together bitching somebody out <laughs> and how they would talk and what they would say so I like those little mm -hmm. groups so just like about the pricey tackle girls, so I know you also had three sisters, like you have three sisters. So was that kind of like a reminder when you were writing that book? Was it like taking you back to your childhood days and you were trying to get what you guys would find interesting? Yeah, totally. See, I mean, like I have three older sisters. My mom ha was five sisters. So very girly houses, you know, lots of sisters, lots of aunts, lots of cousins, all girls. Mm -hmm. I was in boarding school for four years. So I love that dynamic. And obviously, if you have four sisters growing up, everyone is going to say, oh, they call Bennett sisters, you know, mm -hmm. oh, they call Marth sisters. That is going to come up, right? Mm -hmm. These two books are like your go-to. And everyone called my mother, Mrs. Bennett. And everybody was called me Lydia Bennett because I was absolutely crazy. I was boy mad and I love men in uniforms just like Lydia Benny. I don't want to run away with them. <laughs> so 
So, uh, yeah, so I, I guess that is part of it, you know. So definitely I did want to write a book about sisters. And uh, mm -hmm. um, and I also wrote it because I have two daughters. And uh, I, I like that, you know, the kind of dynamic. And I also like the fact, I wanted to stress the fact that these sisters all support each other. There's so many serials now, if you see. Even a lot of the books my daughter's been reading, um, where you have a lot of girl on girl hate and you have sisters who compete and sisters fighting for the same man and stuff like that and that kind of thing I'd like you know I mean that's just such a no no and that never happened in our lives and it, so I didn't want to put this version out there saying this is a very supportive group of sisters and it's mm -hmm. not I don't know those are spaces that I uh, I feel very strongly about that the sisterhood is very important and nothing should come before it yeah. So, and in some way, do you think like those spicy talker girls or like any of your books, but specifically this one, was it an ode to all the books you've read, like especially like Little Women and Pride and Prejudice, like you mentioned, like the whole connection to the sisters in that book, was it like an ode to it or is it something like those books inspired you or like they were like your favorites in no, your childhood, that's why yeah, you wrote of course. I mean, of course, obviously, um, you know, I mean, like I'm not such a Jane Austen fan, but yes, it, it was definitely uh, a, a tribute to the whole it's the most chiclet book I've written. I mean, if you think about it, it is. And uh, I really enjoyed writing it. But on the other hand, I really enjoyed writing bars after that because I was so bloody mm -hmm. sick of those girls in my life. And I was like, let me write a book about boys, you know, flying planes. And <laughs> let me just get out of this pretty little cross stitch and flowers kind of world that I've been trapped in for a while. So, yeah. Was that harder to do, like the switch from writing, like from a woman's perspective to like a very boy or like, you know, bro code book? Was it like a hard switch? No, it was really easy. But then, you know, I mean, I worked on Pepsi for 14 years straight and Pepsi is sold to boys between 15 and 25. So mm -hmm. I've already been meeting boys, interacting with them, researching with them and writing scripts. I would appeal to them for so long. So it's very mm -hmm. comfortable with that space. And also, I mean, like, uh, that's why I look very askance at the whole you know, what's happening around the whole transgender thing mm -hmm. nowadays, because till I was 12, I totally wanted to be a boy. You know, I was so sure, I was so sure I was a boy. So I think I can ratchet up both sides mm -hmm. if I have to, yeah. Yeah, so, and now I've read that you recently moved on to screenplay writing, right? Yeah, so, I do uh, that, but right now, mm -mm. I think much. I've been there but, and I've done that. <laughs> you've done that. So was that very different to writing like a novel or even writing an ad? It's, uh, it's more like writing an ad. It's kind of a between, between writing an ad and writing a book, you know? So it's collaborative mm -hmm. uh, and you do have less power, but you have more power than you have in advertising, you know? So I've written a, a, a screenplay recently, which is being produced, uh, uh, it's being made into a film with um, Arjun Kapoor and Nina Gupta and John Abraham. So that is being shot currently. It's like, a, it's a cross-border story set in Lahore and Amritsar. Mm -hmm. So that's being shot as we speak now. Of course, all the schedules have gone for a toss. Mm -hmm. But um, I did enjoy it. But again, it depends very much on who you're working with. And if you mm -hmm. share a vision with the director and with the actors and with the crew, and then it can be great fun. Otherwise, it can be terrible. It can be like a, like a death sentence to be trapped in that room with people who you don't see eye to eye with. So it really depends on who you're working with. I see. Um, and like back to like writing ads. Um, so that's a very like copywriting is a very sensory process because you have to think about um, the sounds and the visuals. So was that very different compared to writing novels? Or did you try to incorporate those things while writing novels too? Um, I, I think what happened was I think the reason why all my books got picked up to be made into movie was, was because for 14 years I had already been writing in that format. Like when you write ad scripts, when we first started writing ad scripts, you would write audio video together. Like you split the page down the middle and you write audio video. So you're always, you're always thinking visually while you're writing. So I think mm -hmm. that sort of was already, that was my training, you could say. Though I mean, I've never did any creative writing anywhere, like formally, like in education. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think my mind had been, I was thinking visually in any case. So that just happened like that. Okay. So there yeah. was, I mean, but the thing is that, yeah, in a movie, 
on an ad script, you do know that the music will kick in and the cinematography will tell a certain story. So you don't need to detail it in the script uh, because the music will do, you know, there are all these other things that will work mm -hmm. and magic for you. When you're writing a book, you have to put in everything. You have to, you know, you have to describe the stuff and the mood. And if you want people to hear music, then you have to write the music somehow with, mm -hmm. with words. Mm -hmm. So it's different. Um, so when your any of your books, I've heard that all of them have been taken over by other like production houses. Um, so when you decide to let them go ahead with you know making them into a movie or a web series, and like let's say for instance, the way of actor, um, were you wary or were you nervous because you have called yourself a control freak in many times in many interviews? So when that yeah. happens, were you scared that you know like you're gonna lose away that control? Um, no, I mean of course you totally lose the control. There's no question because mm -hmm. I mean I've done enough advertising to know that the director's ahead of ship and you can't you can't really do anything. And it's a very lead, follow, or get out of the way kind of situation. And so I pretty much got out of the way, you know, because it cannot be. You can either lead or you can follow. This is what my husband used to say when he's teaching the kids to drive. I mean, it is always lead, follow, get out of the way. And so I got out of the way because there's no other place really that I could be at, you know. And I think for us, the point is that uh, when you sell the movie rights, there are two things that happen. One is it really ups your profile because the way India is, it was like, oh, it's going to be a movie. Suddenly everybody's very excited about you. So that's one thing. So it really ups your profile. You get invites to all the lit fairs and stuff like that. Um, the other thing is that it does pay you a lot of money. So there's those two things. And as a writer who's making a living by writing novels, I cannot afford to say no to Bollywood when they come calling. So there's that. I have gotten smarter about my contracts now, which I wasn't that smart when I was working on the Zoya and Bitora contract. So I have more creative control and I definitely have control on time. I mean, how long I give you a book for, what rights I give you and so on. So that happened later. Those are later learnings. So you have grown wi like wise though over time. Yes. And um, okay, so just going back a little bit to your advertising career. So like I've heard that advertising is full of like you know all these amusing anecdotes and stuff. So would you like to share any or like you know do you have any starstruck moments when because you shop with some of the biggest celebrities in India. So yeah, when did that yeah. like when did you lose that whole fan goal? in you yeah yeah it's crazy it was it happened really young i mean i was so small and there was like you know you're like uh it, it was great fun so i think a lot of that is in the zoya factor the whole thing of oh my god you know here's Shah Rukh Khan shirtless in his makeup man or here you are like and i remember one shoot when we were working with the uh, amita bachchan and everybody was so intimidated by him and uh, and I, I must have been 25 years old and heavily pregnant. So whenever they wanted to say something to him, they would push me forward. Say, he won't be. I let you because you're pregnant. You go and tell him. What is this? So repeatedly I'm saying, so this, so oh, that. And he's talking to me so nicely because, you know, he can't not say anything to me. So this is all kind of rubbish. And when you shoot with a bunch of cricketers, it's always like walking on eggs because every, the whole team will come. And then... They'll all want to know, is ko kitna line there? Iska kitna line there? Why is my line shorter than his line? Who's got the end line? Who's got the first line? They were so, I mean, it was a mind fail. So there's that kind of rubbish. And if you shoot with like two heroines together, that's again like, you know, you're really walking on eggshells there again because there's one makeup man and there's one makeup man and there's one team. She has like whole team. They have their own team and all that kind of stuff. So it's quite crazy. And Eventually, it's not really good, I think, for the creative process because actually you should just be watching our monitor and doing your stuff. But they're all, I don't know how people in Bollywood get any work done, honestly. To me, they come, they sit at the monitor and they gossip. And it's such delicious gossip, you get so sucked in. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want to do is like, Achha, shoot karte because this is so much fun. So whenever they make a movie, I'm so amazed. I'm like, how do they make a movie? I mean, you know, the, there's so many distractions. But it's, yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's big You go to Bombay, you get all this goss, and it's fun for a while. You you meet people socially. You go to their houses, and it's fun. You know, it's nice. But it's it's not real. Yeah. Okay. So before I hand over to like audience questions, just like a last question from me. Um, so like with the decline of reading, especially lately, and like more people are like, you know, watching things online, like with all of these web series coming up and movies, which have always been there. Um, 
So I was watching one of your interviews, and in which you like it was like quite recently, I think a couple of days back, and you were talking about how that you know um, now women have a lot more control like over the remote and like over what they're watching. So like now more than ever, it's very important for um, you know women to write scripts and women to even direct them to some extent because we need more you know like you mentioned like all these series and like the women what they are doing in the series is not what we want women to watch. So what advice do you have for that? Do you think as like as a writer and like as other writers, do you think they should step into like do you think more women, female writers should step into writing scripts? No, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I do feel you know, I mean, like we always say such horrible things about people like Star Plus and Colors and Z and you know these big platforms in India. But I know for a fact, I'm mean, especially at Star, that they're trying really hard to put out progressive content. You know they really are trying and uh, what happens very often is that there's this whole thing about the trp and you want the show to rate and so sometimes you collect pressure and then you put in some regressive shit just to amp up your ratings and stuff but it's so important to to withstand that temptation and resist that temptation and i think web series allow you to do that so yeah definitely i mean like you should have uh anvita that has just you know directed bulbul and and, and yeah. she's a physicist and it's like a nice strong story and it's a girl story and that's awesome so i think yeah and i think that girls have more money now they can cough up money for a netflix subscription or maybe when things open up for a movie ticket so there is that i mean it's obnoxious to call it a pink rupee but there is a pink rupee or a female rupee and uh, it's getting larger every day so that's good i think yes please write more girls and write and write for girls. I mean, sometimes you know, like when people talk about chiclet. I mean, like, why is it a pejorative? Why do we always say, "Oh, chiclet" so dismissively? What is chiclet? It is girls telling girls stories. Now. That's what you're saying. It's the exactly. same thing. So it's it's that. I mean, I I think that's a term now. Maybe we're ready to just take that term and say, "Yeah, man, everybody come and watch chiclet." No, oh, that's a great answer. We're definitely gonna like put this up everywhere. That you know, this is needed. Um, so these like, chiclet shouldn't be so dismissive, like you said, that it's a woman telling yeah. a woman story. Okay. So give it importance. Yeah. yeah. And also that that who's that lovely girl? I watch all her reviews. She says women telling women stories. Yeah, the Chaita Tiagi. Yeah. Yeah, she's so good, right? And what is she saying? That's chiclet. What is it? That's what it exactly. is. I mean, you just need to own it and say, yeah, man, we're going for this. And um, I, I I don't see why that can't be like a huge category, and why we can't make like three hundred girls making stuff like that. Well, I hope that does go through. But now I do want to open it up to audience questions because when I did send out the invite, um, there's so many of these bookstagrammers, like all of these book bloggers on Instagram, and they were all crazy about it. They're like, oh my God, they're getting Anujya Chauhan, and they've sent in questions. So I would like to invite them to now uh, ask the questions themselves. So to start off with, I would like to invite Kriti Sharma, who has a question for you. Um, I'm pretty you're muted. Do you want to speak? You can mute yourself. Hi. Hello, hello. I can hear Hi, you. Hi, ma'am. You. I'm a very huge fan of yours. I love your work. I have been following you since I was a teenager. And that's when I read Joya Factor for the first time. So I'm crazy about you. <laughs> and uh, I commented on one of your posts and you responded. And that made my day. Like I shared it all over my Instagram. Oh, wow. Hey, I'm very, yes. I am very happy to comment. I know you guys think I'm damn busy or something, but I'm not. <laughs> Ma'am, my question to you is, uh, I think from what you've said throughout this conversation, it's fairly clear that I think Ishan is your favorite male protagonist. Yeah, I'm fond of him. Okay, so he's your favorite. But I wanted to ask, who would you want your daughter to get married to of all the male protagonists? Oh God, uh, I think that would have to be like, you'll have to ask my daughter. I think they've already got the favorites picked out. Uh, <laughs> and I think, I think my daughters sort of are fond of Dylan and Chanu. And <laughs> Kashi Dogra is my new hero. He's very cute as well. Okay, I think Zen Altaf Khan is the best. Like there's no beating him. That's Zen Zen, I forgot about Zen. Zen is awesome. Yeah. Zen but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Zen, I'll marry you. I'll let my girls marry the other. 
Um, so now moving on to the next question from Sneha Ganesh. Um, Sneha? Um, Sneha, can you unmute yourself? Hi, mom. Hello, hi, Sneha. Hi, I really love the work that you do. It's amazing. It's such a great opportunity to be talking to you today. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> so, um, I had a very simple question. So, it's something I've started writing very recently. Mm -hmm. And um, so, as I started writing, one issue that I constantly face is the fact that I get stuck in the middle of a character. So, um, I write. I get stuck in the middle of a character. So I begin with something in mind and then I go on writing to the point and then I'm stuck. So um, would you like to give any feedback? On, I mean, not feedback. Would you like to give any tips on how you go about with your characters, either from advertising or from the way you've been writing? Uh, at what point do you get stuck? Um, so for example, I will begin saying I have this character in my mind. This is how the story has to go, etc. And then I could probably go on for about seven, eight chapters. And then mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. I mean, or, and many a time I get stuck towards the ending also because I don't know how to bring it to a close. I think it's, you know, like uh, you need to have certain dogs. Like, for example, um, certain like points that, you know, like, like how when we were kids, they you have this join the dots kind of thing. So first you have the dots. And you're like, you're holding the story up with various gateposts that there is this, and there is this, and there is this. And basically, you're working towards connecting all those things, you know? So I think you need to be very clear about what those points are in your story. Like if you were crossing a river and there were pebbles and you would step on one and step on one. So you need those stepping stones in place first. So you need an agonize over everything and have everything plotted out, but you do need plot points along the way. And then you set yourself little goals, like you try to get from the first to the second and the second to the third, and that's what will keep you going. I mean, you just keep your head down and you keep writing, you, and you'll get there. I mean, that is simple mathematics. It's like you write every day, a thousand words a day, and in six months, you'll have a novel. You will. Somewhere, there is a lot of discipline in this, you know? Um, whether it's like working out or whether it's like losing weight or gaining weight or whatever your targets are, um, you chip away at it a little every day and it will eventually happen. And it may feel like work for a while, but one day you will have that lovely blazing, all the muses are smiling at you and you'll be writing brilliantly. And you will come to that point, but you come like there are slog overs, right? Mm -hmm. So some yeah. days you have slog overs, some days you have a boundary. But you have to believe and you have to keep doing it every day. Because if you let it go for too long, people will go. Then you start thinking that other idea was nice. Yeah. And then you'll park your eight chapters and you'll pick up one more thing and then you'll have another eight chapters somewhere. But on the other hand, the encouraging thing is that none of it is wasted. Like just minimize it and make a folder and keep it all on your laptop. Because when you finally get all your stepping stones in place, you'll be pulling out things from here and then you realize nothing is a waste. Everything is usable. So don't get discouraged. No, I'm sure this helped a lot of like the writers, mm -hmm. so aspiring writers. And I'm quickly moving on to the next question from Trisha. Um, Hi, mom. How are you doing? Good, yeah, good, yeah. Tell me. Yeah, so I had a question related to your advertising uh, field, the career that you had in advertising. As we know, it's like it's a very hot topic that we are surrounded with all the time. We hear it all the time from this industry is about nepotism. As you said that you've worked with so many big um, stars and actors and like it's a very relevant uh, like topic in nowadays to know how much does does that exist in like the ad industry actually does it like exist is it true that nepotism exists or is just like things that are said by people who can't make it you know what i mean like we have heard so many arguments and like so many point of views from different people but we don't really know the truth about it actually 
So I would love to know if it from you because you've worked so closely with them. I I don't know. I don't think advertising. I don't think advertising people want the children to go into advertising. So I don't think nepotism comes up. <laughs> okay. All of us are like, I I want to feel we chose that we keep telling our children, I'm a client, client, you know, join Nestle, don't join HTA. So uh, I really don't know. I can't really think of like who are these big families in advertising or you know second or third generation people. Um, I haven't come across any such at JWT. I doubt there was anything like that, and that's the agency I worked on always. So no, I don't. I don't. I haven't experienced it in advertising per se. No. Okay, so another question related to advertising, but the person who sent it was sent anonymously, so I don't know their name, so I hope it's answered. Um, they asked that, can you talk about the journey of an ad campaign? Like, what were the steps involved and what was the most challenging thing for you personally? Mm-hmm. See, it's different every time again, uh, Viva. That's what happens is that sometimes you crack it like this. Somebody comes, you know, I mean, like, are you asking me about, like, the process? I mean, the more... the is this more like an educated kind of question or a more creative kind of question? I'm wondering. Because usually what happens is that they come to you with I a think they just... Okay, I, I think, think I lost uh, something up with the signal there. Yeah, yeah so... Sorry, um, I don't know. Yeah, no, usually they'll come to you with a brief, right? Uh, they, they, these, are, these are the various departments in an ad agency. You have the creative department, which is people who are writers and visualizers and filmmakers and so on. Uh, then, you know, or you have the servicing people who interface with the client and who actually come up with the brief. And then you have the strategists who are, um, the, uh, they're called the planners, strategic planners, who will give you a larger background on your brand, the brand category, everybody else. So like if you're working in cold drinks, there's the carbonated soft drinks, you know, CSD, that's the larger... Uh, th- those are the people in your category and beyond that there's water and there's juices and there's alcohol and there's milk and then there is all liquid consumption so where your brand fits in in that whole scheme of things so there are different departments but from a creative person's point of view an account servicing person will come to me with a brief um, and say something like for example if i take a campaign i did in the early 2000s called oa bubbly which got really popular um So uh, they come to me with a brief and they say, you know, we've been making too many ads in Pepsi where people, two people chase each other and they fight over a bottle of Pepsi and then there's some hot chick who comes along and someone takes a Pepsi and there's a twist in the tail and so on. We've done too many of those. We need to focus on the product. So we need, the brief is the joy of cola, right? So that was the brief for bubbly. It was the joy of cola. They said just the joy of like the drink in your mouth, you know, like what does like the organ, organoleptics is to call it, like the feeling of the cola in your mouth. Mm-hmm. So they give you something like that, which is like, okay, for this time, please don't have, you know, Shah Rukh Khan comes running out, there's an hot girl, he gets her a bottle, then he runs, and the dog chases him, then, you know, he gives not the bottle. And, like they didn't want that kind of story. They wanted a product centric story. So then you, from there, you move on to saying something like, okay, if it's the joy of cola, what is the joy of cola? And you say the taste of Pepsi is so good that even if you don't have a mouth, you will grow one in order to drink the Pepsi, which is really the Oi Bubbly brief because it starts with Charu holding a Pepsi bottle and he puts it here and there's a girl and her navel grows a mouth and it goes, Oi Bubbly, and he talks mm-hmm. to it like that. And, you know, Bubbly, I mean, it's like, I don't know what, I mean, it's so politically incorrect nowadays in the kind of world we're living in this whole thing of mm-hmm. stalkers and creepy guys. But at that point, it was like, oh, we bubbly because the Pepsi is bubbly and, you know, so on. So something like that. And that brief, I remember I cracked in like literally standing in the corridor in two minutes. You know, it's like, Achha, aise kar lo na, oh, bubbly. so it was literally like that. And why? Because there's one girl in my office, her name is Bubbly. I saw her passing by. So I had this bright idea. Sometimes it's as easy as that. Sometimes you can sweat and sweat and sweat and take so long before you hit something. And I think the best way, I mean, when it cracks like this, that is usually the best. But very often you do hardworking advertising. Like if you take this campaign I did called Kit Kat Break Banta Hai, which was, uh, I don't know if you all remember, you must have been young. There are these two squirrels who are dancing to some Salman Khan song. I love you song, yeah. 
Yeah, that I love you, that song. And that, I can't really <laughs> how long, how long I sweated before I cracked the whole thing of break banta hai and, you know, the, the whole thing. It took so long. And that film also did really well, but that was like the long road journey. And obviously, it's a different kind of client every time. So, I guess you're trying to balance art, you know, spontaneity with a lot of science. So, it's, Sometimes you get a little too spontaneous, sometimes you get a little too scientific. You're trying to hit a sweet spot every mm -hmm. time. It's pretty imprecise. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just quickly moving on to another question. So I'm just going to combine two of the questions from Tara and um, um, Pritha Banerjee. So they were asking, so you said that you know how you get inspiration from characters around you, right? be it advertising or by writing novels. So um, is there ever a time that, you know, like you could potentially offend a person if they find out that you've taken one of them off quirky traits or, you know, sometimes because you're doing it, people, like, based on people, you know, you, may, you personally may get like emotionally attached. So when that does happen, like, how do you deal with that? I'm always emotionally attached. I don't think you can write without being emotionally attached. You know, you get fond of characters and sometimes you get fond Sometimes what happens is that if you're basing a character on someone you know, then you might be blind to their uh, uh, flaws. And, you know, you may, you could mess up like that. And I think that kind of thing has come up very often when people have been adapting my, my books into like, you know, like right now, Hotstar is making a series with uh, Pricey yeah. Thakur Girls. And they'll say, no, but why is Ishwari talking like this? Like, where is it coming from? And it isn't something I've thought about too much because in my head, Ishwari is me. I mean, whatever she's saying is whatever I'm saying. And so I haven't really decoded it so well. It's intuitive writing. And so when they try to fill in the blank, sometimes they find it hard. But um, I don't think any character should be so complete also with every, you know, every dot and everything crossed and everything perfect. Because then it's good. It's good if they have a few things that they... So a few layers that they don't reveal to you. That's good as well. So, um, so yeah, you should know your characters, but they should be able to surprise you now and then because that's what real people do. Okay, so I can see you're running out of time. So just like a final wrap up question. So I'm sure everyone wants to know the answer to this. So what's next for Nuja Chauhan in terms of books, movies, web series? What can we expect? Well, I'll take the easiest questions first. So uh, the movies is, like I said, uh, the, the movie that I, I wrote a couple of years back, which I think short now is like this cross-border um, story, which is being produced by MA Entertainment. And like I said, starring Arjun Kapoor and Nina Gupta and John Abraham and Raku uh, mm -hmm. And that I'm not very sure when that comes out or whatever. Then there is the web series that Hotstar is making with the uh, Pricey Thakur Girls. And um, that I think is bubbling under and is coming to some kind of fruition. And then of course Baz is with Yashraj Films, but I'm not very sure what they're doing with that. And then most exciting is my new book, which I wrote in the lockdown. And uh, it, it's like I said, it's set in a club modeled on the Delhi Gymkhana Club or the Delhi Golf Club or the Bombay Gymkhana or the Tolly Guns Club or the Bangalore Club. Uh, which is called, um, which is called Club You to Death is the name of the book. It starts with the death of a Zumba instructor in the, he's asphyxiated to death in a gym at the, at the club. It's called the Delhi Turf Club. Okay, so will that be releasing sometime soon? Uh, I've to sent the manuscript. Down in our calendars. I've sent the manuscript to the publishers and now it's up to them. And I think that for them it's, um, it's a marketing decision because I think because of the lockdown, they're not very sure what is the optimum time to release and so on. So that'll be their call. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to call our president back to like give a final word of thanks. Amrita? Thank you, Viva. Um, and on behalf of Speaker Series India at Berkeley, I would really like to thank Anuja Chauhan for taking out the time to interact with us today. Our cup shop session was definitely very informative and I'm sure our audience enjoyed it a lot. Um, we are really thrilled to announce our um, exciting collaboration with Aspire for Her for this event. Um, Aspire for Her is a nonprofit organization powered by extraordinary women leaders as mentors and role models. 
It is aimed at bringing more women into the work po- workforce through partnerships with forward thinking organizations and individuals. You can find more information about them on their website and our social media handles as well. Um, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us today. Please follow our Facebook and Instagram pages to get more information about our other events. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you, Nuja. It was wonderful to chatting with you tonight. Hi, Diva. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you.